Imagine there's a population of objects. They could be anything, but usually there are animals. And they vary in some way. Now, they have baby animals. And those baby animals vary in some way too. The success, the fitness of that animal depends upon those variations. You'll find that over time, the fitter, better variants are going to increase. That is the essence of evolution by natural selection. Armand Leroy, Professor of Developmental Evolutionary Biology at Imperial College London, summarising Charles Darwin's grand idea of evolution through natural selection. The central idea behind this is that nature selects successfully adapted organisms from the not-so-well adapted, and over epic timescales this leads to the evolution of species. But can the same thing happen with cultural objects, such as music, art or philosophy? Is there a survival of the fittest song? Well, Darwin Tunes was an experiment that aimed to answer just these questions. I spoke to Armand about the principles behind this experiment. We have, in a computer, a population of 100 songs or so, and they're about 8 seconds long. And we get the computer just to generate them by random. So there are just 8 second long loops of noise. These musical loops were then allowed to electronically reproduce. The resulting baby loops were slightly different from their parents, but shared a lot of common features. Looks a lot like just regular sex in organisms. Mutations in the form of subtle changes to the noise were also added to the offspring. So these musical loops could reproduce, forming baby offspring music loops. But was this enough for a musical evolution to occur? Now, if you did that, generation after generation, generating new populations of songs, you could do that forever, and the songs would still sound terrible. But this is where the trick comes in. What we do is we take those songs and we stream them to the web and then we get people to say whether they like them or they hate them. Five point scale. And then just the songs that people like, those are the ones which we allow to reproduce and make the next generation. The band songs that people hate, we kill them all. So by asking people what random snippets of music they preferred, the researchers were able to provide a selection pressure for the musical evolution to take place. With this selection present, the random noises did indeed morph from being just noise to being something that resembled music. In fact, you can hear the actual music generated during the Darwin Tunes experiment evolving in the background of this radio feature. Early generations sound toneless and a little bit unpleasant. But after a few thousand generations, you can indeed hear more chords and a greater rhythmic complexity in the music. I wondered if there was any way to measure changes during this evolution. So I met a computer scientist. So hello, I'm Matthias Mauch. Who uses algorithms to analyse musical properties of songs. Now working at St Mary University in London, Matthias told me why computers were used to measure musical evolution in Darwin tunes. A Darwin tune loop doesn't have a tail, so we can't measure the length of the tail. We can measure only general statistical patterns related to either harmony or rhythm that emerge in the, in the whole thing. So the, the audio features were really important in the sense that it's like what in biology would be the analysis of the phenotype. We, we knew what songs survived, so we knew about the, the d descent of all these things, but we didn't actually know the sound surface very well, and the audio analysis helped us to understand that. Matthias's audio analysis tools helped to analyse the music in Darwin tunes, but did the tools actually show an improvement in musical quality? We noticed a strong increase in what we called um, chordal clarity. Um, and also a strong increase in, in rhythmic complexity. Perhaps the same algorithms used during Darwin tunes can be used to analyse music in the real world. Dr Mark Levy used to work in the music information retrieval team for the internet music streaming company Last.fm. He told me what types of data are available to companies like Last.fm. The biggest source of information by volume is what Last.fm calls scrubbles, so the little individual records of a user listened to a particular song at a particular time. A second source of information, which is really cool, are what we call social tags, little tiny snippets of free text attached to individual songs. And those are a really cool source of information, and we did loads and loads of work combining scrubbles and tags. One thing we noticed after a while was that social tags, were, they were very good on genre, but they didn't really tell you very much about slightly more subjective and what you might call musicological aspects of music, which I don't mean grandly, I mean, is it slow, is it fast, is it percussive, or is it acoustic? And it's this analysis of the musicological aspects of a song that Matthias's research focuses on.
When I'm not working on Darwin tunes, I work with real music recordings. For example, my chord recognition uh, stuff was made for audio recordings of pop music, essentially. I've also worked on beat tracking in just normal music, of course. However, measuring the chordal and rhythmic properties of a real piece of music is no easy task. Mark explains. One of the big problems for this sort of research is collecting data, especially anything that involves humans annotating things. You'd be amazed how few of those annotations there are, because doing the work of sitting there making annotations is considered by scientists so unsexy compared to developing the algorithms to make the prediction. So I think um, that's going to be quite an interesting area to watch. I think people are going to become more cunning and clever about crowdsourcing. Despite these challenges in analysing real-world music, Matthias told me about some interesting data of his, which does indeed show changes in musical style over the last few decades in the UK pop music charts. I've shown that there are very definite patterns of change in the charts. In the 70s there was a, suddenly a surge of percussive music, uh, which is probably related to disco emerging and so on. So they're, they're very interesting patterns and now the task is to try to understand why these patterns emerge and uh, how much of these patterns can be attributed to public selection. And it's not just the music analysis algorithms that can apply to the real world. Armand believed that the very findings of the Darwin Tunes experiment might even apply to real world evolution as well. I think that this is an, an idea which possibly applies out there in the real world to real organisms and yet, weirdly enough, we learnt it by playing around with some computer songs. So I think we may have learnt a new evolutionary principle from this very strange system, and that's rather wonderful.